Welcome back, all of you fictional horror-loving junkies. I am Phoenix, and this is Back to Ashes. So, we left off with part two. This is going to be parts three and four of the fictional series I am reading. We're not going to get into anything special. I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into it. And at the end of the story... That's where we end it. Until next week, when I can read you part five and six. Let's get started, shall we? Part three. As the creature maneuvers through the shadows of the chapel, the scraping of its scales against the cold stone sends shivers through the air. The hiss of its breath mingles with the faint, agonized moans for Madri, pinned down by pain in the center aisle. Signaling frantically with my hand, I manage to catch the eye of the two remaining agents hidden behind the altar. I motion a hurried plan, anything to buy us a minute, a chant. They nod grimly, understanding the desperation in my silent plea. Covering fire on my mark. I mouth, counting down with my fingers. The agents ready their weapons, eyes locked on the serpentine horror. Now, I shout, and the chapel erupts with the sharp crack of gunfire. Bullets pepper the air, aimed at the creature, as it rears back, hissing angrily. Its feathers puff out, reflecting some shots, but clearly disoriented by the onslaught. Audrey's pain groans grow louder as I break cover and make a mad dash toward her. Her face is etched with agony, eyes squeeze shut as she tries to press her hand against the wound on her arm. I slide to the ground beside her, grabbing her under her shoulders. Hang on, we're getting out of this, I shout over the roar of our covering fire. We're exposed, every second out in the open, a gamble against death. I move as quickly as I can, half dragging, half carrying Audrey towards the relative safety of a shattered pew. Sharp feathers fly past us, embedding into the wooden beams and stone walls with deadly precision. A feather grazes my shoulder, slicing through the fabric of my jacket with a hot sting that sends me reeling. Audrey grips my arm, her voice strained but sharp. Ramon, behind you! I twist around just in time to see the serpent, its jaws agape in line with needle-like teeth lunging towards us. Instinctively, I throw myself and Audrey to the side, the creature's jaws snapping shut inches from where my leg had been. The ground trembles under the impact as the creature's head thuds into the stone floor where we had just lain. Audrey, despite her injury, manages to wrestle her sidearm from its holster. The first shot goes wide, a deafening echo into the cramped space of the chapel, missing the creature as it twists violently. But she steadies her arm, squints through the agony, and squeezes the trigger again. The second shot found its mark. The bullet hits the creature square in the jaw, an explosion of dark, vicious blood that sizzles when it hits the stone tiles. The impact is so forceful, it severs the lower part of the jaw completely, leaving it hanging grotesquely by a thread of sinew and skin. The creature lets out a terrible, gurgling scream, its eyes flashing a ferocious red as it thrashes wildly, sending debris flying. Its blood, a luminescent, combustible fluid, splatters across the aged wood pews and the dry splintered walls of the chapel. The chapel, already reeking of decay and abandonment, swiftly becomes a tinderbox. With each convulsive swing of the creature's injured body, more of the incendiary blood soaks into the porous wood which starts to smolder under the chemical heat. Amidst the chaos, the air grows thick, with the acrid smell of burning resin, smoke bellowing in dense clouds that claw at my throat and sting my eyes. Audrey, half dragged into a marginally safe corner, coughs violently, her face smeared with sweat and grime. Grabbing my partner's arm, I look under for an escape route. The main door through which we entered is now enveloped in flames. 
the fire feeding hungrily on the old varnished wood. The back, I shout, nodding towards a small barred window that might just be large enough for us to squeeze through. As Audrey and I stagger towards the back of the chapel, the air grows hotter, filled with a thick choking smoke from the burning wood. The creature, wounded and enraged, thrashes less coherently now, its movement becoming sluggish as it bleeds out the luminous flammable liquid. Every drop that hits the floor ignites another flame, spreading the fire rapidly across the chapel's interior. I glance back to see the only one of the agents, Delgado, has followed us to the back. The other agent, Ortega, isn't so lucky. As the chapel devolves into an inferno, he's caught by the torrent of the creature's blood. The flames envelop him instantly, wrapping around his body in a fiery embrace. At first, Ortega's screams cut through the roar of the flames, his body a silhouette against the firestorm. He flails, trying desperately to beat back the flames that devour his uniform and sear his flesh. But... His movements slow, becoming jerky and unnatural, as if he's no longer in control of his own body. Then, eerily, he stops screaming. His charred form straightens up, turning towards us with an uncanny precision, his movements no longer those of a man in agony, but of a puppet jerked by invisible strings. His eyes, what's left of them, glint with a strange reflective quality under the flickering light of the fire. He doesn't seem to feel the pain anymore, his body moving with a dreadful intent as he comes closer, the heat from his smoldering flesh making the air waver in front of him. Back! I shout to Audrey and Delgado, pushing them towards the small window at the back of the chapel. I reach it first, smashing through the bars with the butt of my shotgun. The metal gives away with a screech, opening up a narrow escape route from the burning hell inside. Audrey, weakened by her entry and the smoke, coughs harshly, her body heaving with each breath. I grab her under the arms, practically carrying her to the window. She struggles, though first. The jagged edges of the broken window tearing at her clothes as she squeezes through. Delgado helps from the other side, pulling her out and away from the inferno. I'm about to follow when Ortega's hand clamps down on my ankle with an iron grip. His skin is hot, almost scalding to the touch, yet the flames don't spread to me. His eyes are no longer human, but something darker emptier. You cannot escape what is coming. The cycle must be completed. He intones, his voice echoing with a reverberating death that seems to come from far away. With a desperate effect, I kick at his grip, my boot connecting with his face. There's a sickening crunch, but it doesn't seem to affect him as it should. Instead, he simply releases me, his expression empty as he turns back towards the flames that now fully engulf the chapel. I scramble through the window, tumbling out into the cooler air of the evening, rolling to extinguish any embers that might have caught on to my clothes. As we catch our breaths, the smoke billowing from the chapel begins to swirl and coalesce into a larger, more menacing form. It's as if the smoke itself is alive, gathering into a dark, dense cloud above the chapel. The shape it forms is both vague and disturbingly familiar. A giant winged creature, its wings spread wide across the sky, casting a massive, ominous shadow over the land beneath it. As we watch, frozen and horrified, the figure raises what looks like an arm, pointing directly at us before dissipating into the night air, leaving behind only the chaotic dance of the flames. As we stare up at the dissipating smoke, an icy knot of dread tightens in my gut. Audrey leans heavily against me, her breathing shallow and ragged. But... 
It's the look in her eyes that says it all. She's thinking the same thing. We didn't just survive a freak encounter. We played right into the hands of something much bigger and darker than we could have ever imagined. The chapel structure finally gives way under the inferno's wrath. The building collapsing in on itself as we make our way into the darkness. As the last embers of the chapel's destruction flicker in the night, the sounds of approaching sirens and thumping of helicopter blades fill the air. Within minutes, the area of the burned-out chapel becomes a hub of frantic activity as backup arrives, bringing an armada of armored vehicles, SWAT teams, and multiple news helicopters circling overhead like birds of prey, eager for a story. Amidst the chaos, medics rush to our side. Audrey, pale and shivering from shock and blood loss, is quickly attended to. I'm examined for injuries. A few burns and that deep cut on my right shoulder from the creature's feather. As we're being patched up, sitting on the back of an ambulance, officers coordinate to contain the area, while firefighters tackle the all-consuming blaze. Sheriff Marine Torres herself arrives at the scene just as the flames begin to die down. Her expression sat in a hard line that speaks volumes before she even steps out of her cruiser. Her silver hair, usually styled meticulously, has pulled back into a no-nonsense ponytail tonight, and her sharp gray eyes scan the scene with both horror and an unmistakable edge of anger. Beside her, Captain Barrett emerges, his burly frame tense with the urgency of the night's events. Torres doesn't waste time on pleasantries. His eyes sweep the scene, burning remains, exhausted officers, and then land on me with an intensity that makes me straighten up despite the pain. Detectives, what the hell happened here? Her voice is controlled, but there's an undercurrent of fury that tells me she's barely holding it back. I stand though the medic tugs at my sleeve, signaling that he's not done. Ignoring him, I step forward. Sheriff, we followed the leads to the chapel based on evidence we get leads? She interrupts, her tone rising slightly with incredulity. Leads don't usually end with half the county's emergency services scrambling to contain what looks like a scene from a horror movie. Barrett doesn't bother hiding his frustration as he looks from me to the wreckage and back again. I gave you clear instructions, Costello, he growls, his voice low but carrying in the quiet night. I told you, low profile, assess and extract. I wince both from the sharpness in his tone and the ache in my shoulder. Sir, we encountered something uh, unexpected. The situation escalated quickly. Unexpected. Barrett's scoff is sharp as he gestures broadly at the chaos around us. Understatement of the century. What we have here is a full-scale crisis. Audrey, though grimacing through pain, tries to interject. Sir, with all due respect, we couldn't have anticipated... Barrett cuts her off, his voice booming, even over the distant clamor of emergency vehicles. I don't want to hear it, Dawson. We lost good people tonight. Good people who relied on you to make the right call. He shakes his head, adding, God damn it. I have to go and tell families that their loved ones aren't coming home. His words sting more than the physical injuries. Torres cuts through the simmering tension with a brisk wave of her hand, her gaze sweeping the wreckage once more before settling on Barrett and us. I don't have time for this. I've got a PR nightmare to manage and a press conference in less than an hour. Barrett, handle this. Without waiting for a response, she turns on her heel and heads back to her cruiser, her team in tow leaving a palpable void that Barrett fills with his formidable presence. 
he steps forward, his expression grim and resolute, under the flashing lights of the approaching fire trucks. Estello, Dawson, you're both suspended until further notice. Barrett's voice is flat, almost mechanical in its delivery. He extends his hand, not in offer, but in demand. Badges and guns, now! Audrey and I exchange a glance, the weight of the situation sinking in. With heavy hearts, we comply, unclipping our badges and handing over our service weapons. The cold metal feels foreign as it leaves my hands. Get yourselves debriefed and go home. I'll be in touch about the formal proceedings. His tone leaves no room for argument, and with a final nod, he turns away, leaving us to face the chaos of the night on our own. As the last flickers of chaos die down and the heavy tread of emergency responders fades into a rhythm, Audrey and I find a brief respite in the cruiser and pull out my phone, noticing the barrage of missed calls and texts from Rocio. My stomach tightens as I remember telling myself I'd call back, only I never did. The screen shows her message, simple check-ins that progressed to more worried tones as the night dragged on without a word from me. I swallow hard, feeling the familiar pang of guilt tighten around my chest. There's a voicemail from my wife, Rocio, that stands out. The timestamp shows it was left just a few hours ago. I press play, the phone held close to my ear, bracing myself for her anger at not calling her back. Her words are hurried, her tone edged with panic. Ramon, I don't know what's going on, but there's something outside the house. They've been lurking around since dusk, just standing there across the street watching. I called the police, but they said they're stretched thin tonight with some emergency and might take a while. I'm scared. As the voicemail played, I put the phone on speaker, letting Audrey listen. Rocio's voice, usually so calm and composed, was laced with undeniable fear. The boys say they heard scratching at the wall. Her tone edged with panic. I think, I think I saw a shadow move past the back window. Rocio's voice cracks as the background noises grow louder on the voicemail. The unmistakable sound of shattering glass piercing her words. Ramon, they're in the house. Her scream slices through the air raw and terrified, followed by the high-pitched cries of our boys, their fear palpable even through the digital recording. The voicemail cuts off abruptly, leaving a haunting silence that chills me to the bone. My hand shakes as I lower the phone. The afterimage of the call's timer blinking mockingly back at me. Chapter 4 As we pull onto my street in the quiet Claremont neighborhood of San Diego, the sight that greets me sends shivers down my spine. The front door of my house is not just open. It's torn off its hinges, lying in a shattered heap on my front lawn. The windows are dark, the interior swallowed by an ominous shadow that seems to pulse with a life of its own. Fuck! I mutter, pulling the cruiser to a sharp stop. Audrey's already at the trunk, her hands steady as she pulls out a couple of tactical flashlights and our backup weapons, a pair of Glock 22s we'd stash for emergencies. We make our entry, the beam of our flashlight slicing through the suffocating darkness of the living room. The house feels unnaturally silent, like it's holding its breath. As I stepped over the threshold, the splintered wood of the door frame crunches under my boots. The living room is in chaos. Furniture overturned, cushions slashed, family pictures lie in tattered heaps on the floor. A sharp pang hits me as I spot a small framed photo of Rocio and the boys. The glass cracked 
but their smiles still bright under the jagged lines. My flashlight catches something else on the floor. Dark, thick droplets that lead towards the hallway. Blood. A lot of it. My stomach knots as I follow the trail, each drop a grim breadcrumb leading deeper into the nightmare. The overhead light flickers sporadically, casting quick flashes of light over the scene. A grim strobe effect that reveals more splashes of blood and worse, small drag marks as if someone had been pulled. My mind rolls back to the Vasquez case. Memories of the screams, the gunfire, and the blood smeared across cold concrete flash through my mind. We follow the trail of blood to our bedroom, the dread in my gut twisting tighter with each step. The door is ajar, and as I push it open, the scene inside makes my heart stop. The bedroom looks like a tornado tore through it. The windows are shattered, sheets tangled and shredded, while dresser drawers hang open, their contents strewn across the floor. But none of that compares to what lies on the bed. There's the body. A sight so grotesque it takes a few seconds for my brain to even process what I am seeing. The figure is laid out almost revertently, arms and legs spread, pinned down by shards of broken glass and splintered wood. The body's face is... gone. Skin and muscle torn away, leaving only the gleaming white bone of the skull staring back. The eyes are missing, hollow, empty sockets that feel like they're looking through me, and the hands. Christ, the hands are gone, severed at the wrists, leaving bloody stumps soaking the bed in a ritualistic display. My flashlight trembles in my hand as I take a step closer to the body, dread gnawing at my insides. Every instinct is screaming at me to turn away, to leave, but I can't. I have to know if it's Rocio. I force myself to look closer. My mind races, trying to piece together the details that don't add up. Then it hits me like a freight train. This body, this poor, mutilated body, isn't Rocio. It's too small. The realization floods in all at once. Sophia. Sophia, the young Colombian we hired to help with the kids. The girl had just started working for us not even two months ago. The recognition brings no real comfort, just a shift in the dread that has been tightening around my heart. I stagger back my stomach turning, and I grip the doorframe to steady myself. Just then, a soft rustle from the hallway shatters the silence, pulling my attention away from the grisly sight on the bed. My heart pounds against my ribcage as a sick sense of dread fills the room. The rustle transforms into a loud, crackling chuckle that seems to echo from every corner of the room, clawing its way under my skin in the worst possible way. Audrey grabs my arm. Her grip is tight. Ramon, behind you! I spin around, gripping the Glock tighter as its flashlight beam swings towards the door. The sight that gets me robs me of comprehension. Framed by the splinter door, peering out from the darkness of the hallway, is an abomination. The thing is wearing Sophia's face like a sick mask, her features stretched across its bony skull in a macabre grin that drips with dark oozing blood. As it notices our stairs, the creature begins to move, or rather contort, with a fluidity that defies human anatomy. It starts a crab walk, its limbs bending unnaturally as it scuttles towards us. The movement is jerky, 
accompanied by the sickening sound of cracking bones and the wet slap of its limbs across the hardwood floor. The creature's twisted advance triggers something primal within me. Every ounce of fear I leave morphs into a murderous rage. My home, my sanctuary, has been violated. My family threatened. This abomination before me, wearing Sophia's face like a trophy, ignites a fury so raw, so potent, it almost blinds me. But I don't shoot. I need it to talk, if it can do that. So, with a guttural yell, I charge. My instincts take over. I leap forward, slamming into the creature with all the force I can muster. The impact sends us both crashing back into the hallway, the entity's form undulating under me. It's an explosion of fury, all punches and elbows, fueled by a desperate need to protect what's left of my family. I seize it by the shoulder, slamming it against the wall with a force that knocks nearby picture frames from the wall. Audrey isn't far behind, grabbing a heavy bookend from a nearby shelf. She swings with all of her might. The object connects with a sickening thud against the thing's head, sending it reeling. I grab a broken curtain rod, its jagged end sharp and splintered. Without hesitation, I plunge it into the creature's chest. It lets out a guttural screech, writhing violently as I press harder, driving the makeshift spear deeper and deeper. Its movements become frantic, limbs flailing in unnatural angles, but the rod holds firm. A howl erupts from its twisted mouth, a high-pitched, inhuman scream that reverberates through the hallway. The thing flails, but I hold firm, pinning it against the wall as dark, viscous blood spills from the wound, pooling at our feet. Its hands claw weakly at me. I twist the rod deeper, ignoring the splintering of bone. My voice a low growl as I lean closer to its deformed face. Where is my family? What have you done with them? I demand each word punctuated with a twist of the rod. The creature, pinned and writhing, coughs up a grotesque mixture of blood and something darker, its eyes flickering with a malevolent light. It speaks in a stilted Spanish, each word dropping like stones from its mouth. Betrayal. We know. Your betrayal. My grip on the curtain rod tightens, the metal biting into my palms. What betrayal? Where's my family? The creature's voice is raspy and oddly robotic. We know the truth about Vasquez. You betrayed everyone. I'm thrown off guard. What the fuck do you know about the Vasquez case? I hiss. Lies. Lies. Everyone knows. Costello the traitor. The creature's words come out garbled, like a parrot regurgitating phrases it doesn't understand. The weight of the creature's words hits me like a physical blow. I'd been embedded with the cartel in order to gain their trust. Officially, my role was to relay critical information back to the sheriff's department to bring down one of the largest drug operations funneling into the southwest. The Vasquez case was supposed to be a straightforward operation, intercept a massive shipment of drugs and weapons moving through the border, and, if possible, take down the infamous Sinaloa cartel boss, Manuel Erdon Vasquez. But things had gone sideways fast. It had ended in a disastrous shootout, with bodies of agents and cartel members alike scattered across a warehouse on the outskirts of Chula Vista. The creature laughs a horrifying gurgling sound. <laughs> the queen knows the game's end today, Castello. 
hospital on the rat. Its words cut deeper than any physical wound could, unraveling years of buried secrets. The revelation shatters the last vestige of restraint in me. How do you know about that? Who are you? For years, I lived a double life. To everyone else, I was Detective Ramon Castillo, a straight-laced cop, a family man who did the job by the book. But beneath that facade, I was something else entirely. A ghost in the machine. I wasn't just a dirty cop taking bribes or looking the other way when drugs hit the streets. I was something far more dangerous. A mole embedded deep within the sheriff's department from the very beginning. Handpicked by Don Manuel himself to be his eyes and ears to infiltrate law enforcement and feed them just enough to stay one step ahead of the feds, the DEA, and anyone else trying to bring him down. I've got a thousand questions running through my head, all of them colliding with the weight of what the creature just said. But none of that matters right now. Not the past. Not the mess I've been trying to cover up for years. My family is all I care about. I twist the curtain rod deeper, my breath coming out in ragged bursts as I glare down at the monstrous thing. Its misshapen body rise in pain, and there's no humanity in its eyes. It's like looking into a void. A cold, endless void. Where the fuck are my wife and sons? I growl, my voice barely recognizable, even to myself. <sighs> if you want to see them again, you must return the dagger of holy death to the scatterer of ashes. The scatterer of ashes. The words hit me like a freight train. That name again. The same one Lucia Alvarez had whispered in her dying breath. My mind races. What dagger? But ultimately, these words mean nothing to me. What the hell are you talking about? I don't have any damn dagger. My voice cracks as I slam the creature back against the wall. Fury clouded my thoughts. I need answers, real ones. Where are they? It only continues, its voice a broken monotone chant. The dagger was taken, stolen, but it must be returned, or their souls will be ashes in the wind. As I stared down at the creature, struggling to keep my anger from boiling over, it starts to make a guttural sound, a hacking cough that I think might be its last breath. But no, its mouth opens wider, blood and bile dribbling from its lips as it begins to spit out something else. Numbers. A garbled string of numbers. Thirty-two... Seventy-nine, forty-seven, one, sixteen, ninety-six, twenty-five. The thing repeats the digits like a broken record over and over again, its voice a raspy wheeze. I slam it against the wall again, the jagged rod still pinning it in place. You think I'm playing around? Tell me where my family is, or I'll rip you apart. Ramon, wait. Audrey's voice cuts through the chaos, urgent but calm. She's clutching her phone, her face pale but focused. Those numbers, I think they're coordinates. It's giving us something. My grip slackens slightly as Audrey's words sink in. Coordinates. A location. This could be where they're holding Rocio and the boys. It could also be a trap, but it's all we have. Realizing I'm not going to get anything more coherent from the creature, I turn to Audrey. Did you get those coordinates? 
She nods, her expression grim as she taps her phone, saving the numbers. With one final guttural roar, I drive the curtain rod all the way through, impaling the creature fully against the wall. The force of the impact sends a spider web of cracks through the plaster, dust cascading down like grim snowfall. The creature's body spasms violently, a puppet jerking on unseen strings. Its mouth opens in a silent scream. The stretch, managed sibilance of Sophia's face distorting into something even more nightmarish. The room fills with a sickening, squelching noise as the body begins to disintegrate. Bits of its flesh start sloughing off in wet, heavy clumps, hitting the floor with sickening plops. The blood, dark and too thick, pour out of its torrents, pooling at the base of the wall in a viscous, spreading stain. The smell is unbearable. A putrid mix of decay and something bitter and burnt that fills the air and coats the inside of my throat. As the creature completely disintegrates, it leaves nothing but the sagging, empty skin that once belonged to Sophia. The skin, paper thin and now drained of life, pills away from the wall like a deflated balloon. It slumps to the floor in a crumpled heap. The seams of flesh ragged and torn as though it had been hastily stitched together, only to be discarded. I'm standing there breathing hard, the jagged curtain rod still in my hand, dripping with whatever the hell that thing was made of. My mind is racing, trying to make sense of the creature's last words. The numbers. The coordinates. Everything is spinning out of control. Audrey's hand grasps my shoulder, yanking me back just as my vision starts to blur with anger. Ramon, she shouts. I step away from the mess, wiping my hands on my pants out of reflex, even though I know there's no getting rid of the stain this day has left. How the hell did it know about Vasquez? Audrey finally asks, her voice cutting through the thick air. How did it know about what we did? Audrey's questions hang in the air, and I can't avoid the look she's giving me. The department had its suspicions about me losing a cartel plant for a long time, but they never had enough evidence to pin me down. Instead, they assigned Audrey, the golden girl of the force, to keep tabs on me. She was clean. Too clean. At first, it was all business. Long shifts, stakeouts, and her doing her job by the book. But things got messy. After her nasty divorce, I could see the cracks in Audrey's usual tough facade. She was vulnerable, raw, and it didn't take much to influence. Late nights led to beers, then talks. I tested her, dropped hints, and when she didn't report it, I knew she was slipping. Then we started fucking. Once that line was crossed, it got easier to pull her in. She let things slide, fed the department false reports. It was subtle at first, small lies buried in paperwork. But by the time the Vasquez case blew up, she was too deep. We both were. Audrey's standing there waiting for an answer, but the truth is, I don't have one. Not one that makes sense, anyway. Everything feels off, like we're playing a game we don't understand, and someone else is pulling the strings. My mind races, piecing together fragments of conversations, half-heard rumors, and the nagging feeling I've had for months, maybe years. Look, Audrey, I start, keeping my voice low but serious. There's something bigger at play here, this thing, whatever the hell it was. It knew too much. About Vasquez. About me. About us. She raises an eyebrow, clearly skeptical, but willing to hear me out. 
You think it was a setup? I nod, running a hand through my hair, still sticky with sweat and grime. Barrett was way too quick to throw us under the bus, don't you think? First sign of trouble, and we're suspended. No questions asked. And Torres? She couldn't get out of there fast enough. She's washing her hands of this whole thing, like she knew it was coming. Audrey looks at me skeptically. Wait, you think the captain and sheriff are involved? I press on, my thoughts racing. Think about it, Audrey. Rocio calls 911, panicking because someone's outside our house. Someone's watching, waiting. And what happens? Nothing. The police are too busy to respond to a cop's wife in distress. That's some bullshit. Audrey is staring at me, her expression unreadable. I know what she's thinking. I can see it in her eyes. She's wondering if she can trust me. And hell, I don't even know the answer myself. But one thing's clear. We can't trust anyone in the force anymore. Not after this. As though to drive home my point, the distant sound of police sirens pierces the air. They're coming for us. Shit. I mutter under my breath. We need to move. Now. We move fast, slipping through the back of the house and out into the yard. I glance towards my cruiser parked out front. We can't take it. That's the first thing they'll be looking for. I grab my laptop and some gear from the cruiser, shoving them into a duffel bag. The flashing lights are closer now, the distant wail of sirens growing louder with each passing second. My eyes dart towards the neighbor's driveway. Dave's old Chevy Tahoe sits there. I remember hearing Dave mention last week that his family was heading out of town for vacation. The car won't be reported missing for at least a couple of days. Stay low, I whispered to Audrey as we make our way to the SUV, ducking behind bushes and fences. We reach the Tahoe and I jimmy the lock open with a practice move. Hot wiring cars isn't something I'm proud of knowing, but in moments like this, I'm damn grateful for the skill. Sorry, Dave. I mutter under my breath, promising myself I'll return the vehicle once this nightmare is over. If I make it out of this. The engine roars to life and we're off, slipping away before the first patrol car rounds the corner. We know exactly where to go. The safe house. Miles outside the city, buried deep into the desert hills, where no one asks questions and fewer people give answers. Only Audrey and I know about it. A just-in-case shit ever hits the fan. We pull up to the rundown cabin just as the sun begins to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows across the desert. I kill the engine and step out into the cooling air, my boots sinking into the soft dirt. Audrey follows, her face pale and drawn, and her eyes are sharp, constantly scanning the horizon for any sign we've been followed. The cabin isn't much to look at, a single-story shack barely holding itself together, with peeling paint and windows that rattle in the wind, but it's all we have. It's got the one thing going for it. No one knows we're here. We make a quick sweep of the place, checking every corner, every window, satisfied that we're alone. I head to the small utility room in the back and fire up the generator. The old machine sputters to life, filling the cabin with a low, steady hum and bathing the room in dim, flickering light from a single overhead bulb. Audrey sinks into one of the worn-out chairs by the small kitchen table, cradling her injured arm. Blood has soaked through the dressings. I grab the first aid kit from the duffel bag and kneel beside her. This is going to sting, I warn, pulling out a bottle of antiseptic. She just nods, her jaw clenched. I work quickly, cleaning the wound and wrapping it in fresh gauze. As I finish, she looks up at me with those green eyes. Your turn, she says, nodding towards my shoulder, where blood has soaked through my jacket from the cut I got back at the chapel. I don't protest. There's no point. 
I pull off my shirt, revealing the mess underneath. Not just the wound, but everything else. Her eyes trace the tattoos that cover my torso. Intricate, black patterns swirling across my chest, down my arms, and over my back. Symbols, dates, names. There's the black scorpion crawling up my ribs, a mark of my loyalties to the Sinaloa. But that's not the one that catches her attention. It's the other tattoo, the one just below it. A small skull with a thin blue line running through it. The mark of the cop killer. It's not the first time she's seen it. But this time, it feels more bisqueral. Her fingers tremble slightly as she redresses the wound on my shoulder. Once Audrey finishes the bandage, she sits back in the creaky chair. So what now? she asks. I take a moment to compose my thoughts. One thing's for sure. I'm not playing their game. Whoever's behind this, they want me to follow their little script like a good little pond. But I'm not about to let some fucking psycho dictate how this ends. We go rogue, I say, straightening up. We find my family. We get them safe. And then we hunt these bastards behind this and make them fucking pay. Every last one of them. She nods in solidarity. Okay, let's get to work. We get to work fast, turning the cabin into a makeshift war room. The table is covered in papers, maps, printouts of the coordinates, and anything we can pull from the limited info we have. I thank God the Wi-Fi still works, even if it's spotty. The satellite dish on the roof is old, but it'll do for now. I turn on my laptop, pulling up satellite images of the coordinates the creature spit out. My fingers tremble as I type the coordinates. The numbers flash on the screen. Latitude, 32.7947. Longitude, 116.9625. Andre stands next to me, peering over my shoulder. Where is it? she asks. El Cajon. I mutter, my thumb scrolling through the map. The dots lands near an industrial part of the town east of San Diego, not too far from where the highways intersect. I zoom in on the satellite view, my brow furring as I try to make sense of the location. Andre leans over. That's where they're keeping your family? No, that's where they want us to go. My voice is quiet but firm. An industrial zone, surrounded by empty lots and abandoned warehouses. Multiple entry points, but no clear exit. It's perfect for an ambush. Looking closer at the coordinates the creature gave, something feels off. There's a small detail on the satellite map that stands out. A patch of land that doesn't quite fit. Among the sprawling industrial area, there's an unusually large swath of undeveloped land. See that? I point at the spot. Audrey leans in closer, squinting at the screen. Yeah, what about it? No structures. No roads. Leading in or out. Just an open field surrounded by factories and warehouses. It doesn't make sense for a prime spot like that to be empty, I say, furring my brow. I swipe through some more satellite images, zooming in on the area from different angles. That's when something weird stands out. A subtle change in elevation around the edge of the empty land. Look at this, I said, tapping on the screen. The terrain dips in around the edges here. It's like the ground's hollow. Audrey frowned. You think it's built over something? Hmm, could be, I replied, leaning back, my brain churning through possibilities. A bunker, maybe, or an underground tunnel system. Something's going on under there, that's for damn sure. We spend the next half hour combing through public records, land surveys, and old building permits. 
At first, it seems like a dead end. Everything shows the area has been zoned for industrial use, but never developed. No permits, no environmental assessments. Nothing. But then, Audrey stumbled onto a curious document buried in the city's geological surveys. Wait a second, she said, her finger hovering over the screen. This whole area sits on top of an aquifer. An aquifer? Why would that matter? I ask, my interest peaked. Well, aquifers are natural underground reservoirs of water, she explained. But here's the kicker. This particular aquifer has been marked off-limits for drilling or development since the 1980s. Apparently, it's one of the main sources of fresh water for parts of San Diego County. Anything that disturbs it could cause major contamination. So no one could build onto it, I mutter, rubbing my chin. But that doesn't mean something isn't under it. We exchange looks. This can be the perfect place to hide something. If there's a network of tunnels or caves down there, it could be completely invisible from above ground. After some digging, we find a few old utility reports that hint at the existence of some storm drains and maintenance tunnels that have been sealed off decades ago. One report in particular catches our attention a sewer line that has been rerouted with its original access points marked as decommissioned near the coordinates we're looking at. Bingo, I say, tapping the screen. This is our way in. Audrey and I sit there staring at the laptop screen as if the dots will magically connect themselves. The coordinates, the aquifer, the sealed tunnels, it's all adding up to something. But there's still that damn missing piece. What do you think that dagger is about exactly? Audrey asks, breaking the silence. She sounds as exasperated as I feel. I let out a sigh, rubbing my temples. Uh, I don't know, but I think it ties back to the Vasquez case. We both knew that thing was messed up from the start. My mind runs through the events of the night. Remember how on edge the cartel was? They were whispering about something big, something more valuable than anything they'd ever smuggled before. It wasn't just the usual haul of narcotics and AKs. Yeah, they were talking in hushed tones about the relic, Audrey adds. It could all be connected. There's only one way to know for sure. I nod, already reaching for my jacket. We have to go talk to Vasquez himself. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to part three and part four of this amazing, fictitious piece of literature. I will leave this here, but in the meantime, please take care of yourselves, and I hope to see you next week to finish out this story. And let me tell you, it's really good. So, in the old-fashioned way, have yourselves a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all. <laughs>